All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. Nikki Haley, can you stop playing in our faces? <laughs> like, how is it that every time you answer a question, you piss off everybody? <laughs> make it make sense. Anyway, let's go to the clip. Are you a racist party? Are you involved in a racist party? No. We're, we're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Are we perfect? No. But our goal is to always make sure we try and be more perfect every day that we can. I know I faced racism when I was growing up, but I can tell you today is a lot better than it was then. Our goal is to lift up everybody, not go and divide people on race or gender or party or anything else. We've had enough of that in America. That's why I'm so passionate about doing this. I don't want my kids growing up where they're sitting there thinking that they're disadvantaged because of a color or a gender. I want them to know that if they work hard, yeah. they can do and be anything they want to be in America. Nikki, you're going to have to try a new approach. You know, what I find so interesting is now for you to be somebody who's running for office, you would think that you'd already kind of have like that, that back pocket of answers ready when they give you these type of questions because, you know, most politicians like to BS their way through an election anyway, right? When people give them questions, they kind of talk in circles and will kind of give you a non-answer but an answer that's safe enough where nobody gets pissed off. That's literally all she had to do. When they gave her that question, all she had to say was some crap about, you know, what I love about America is the fact that each and every day we can wake up with a chance to learn, with a chance to do better, with a chance to ensure that the future is better for those who come after us, with a chance to ensure that our children have a country that they too can love the way that I love America. And that's why when I become president, I'm gonna make sure that no one feels left out because that's what being an American is about. All about democracy, freedom, and liberty. Like that's all she had to do, she would have been good. But no, Nikki wants to keep playing this stupid game where she feels that if she can continue to rewrite history in order for a political come up to come into her pocket, that she might have a shot at possibly becoming the president. And so here we are again, just a month after the, the Civil War comments, and now all of a sudden, America has never had a problem with racism. Because at first, when I saw her answer, the answer I thought she was going to say was, okay, you know, it was an issue in the past, but we're, we're working towards fixing the future. That's kind of the approach people tend to have. I still be looking at folks sideways like, ain't nothing about the past. That Did y'all see what the trending topic was on Twitter today? <laughs> right? Right? Do, do you see who the front runners are in these elections? Do you see the policy that, that's being implemented? Do you see what's happening with the Supreme Court? Do you see what's happening in education? This is not a thing of the past. We're living in it right now. But anyway, you know, that's, that, that's literally, you know, the space that we're in. So watching her break her neck to try and, and rewrite a narrative. And so now we're in this space because, again, racism is already a very layered conversation. People like to run from it because there's so many directions that the conversation can, can go. But, you know, in the past, we've always had, had this narrative where people always said, you know, racism is bad. Don't do it. Be a good person. Don't be like the idiots of the past. Just make sure that you always try to be the best person you can be and treat others the way they want to be treated. And then they'll throw in a Martin Luther King quote and content of the character and let's all sing Kumbaya and Hands Across America and We Are the World and finish it off with Purple Rain, right? Then the narrative shifted to racism was a thing of the past. And when we say the past, we mean way back then, so long ago that it's not even relevant today. So let's just act like it doesn't exist anymore. And now we're in this space where the conversation is, it wasn't even a thing of the past. It's just never happened. And as a matter of fact, if you bring it up, you, my friend, are actually the racist because you are race baiting. I'm sure many of you have heard that conversation at some point. And so Nikki has decided to jump on this train. She, she said, never mind the racism is bad train. Never mind the racism is a thing of the past train, which I'm gonna still give you smoke for. But she said, we're just gonna act like it doesn't exist. But what's so funny, is 15 seconds into her answer, she contradicts herself. She says America's never had a problem with racism, but then she talks about the childhood she had and how she had to deal with racism as a child. So I'm like, wait, so you can acknowledge that as a child, you had to experience some element of racism because your peers saw you as an Indian girl and a brown skinned girl in a place like South Carolina back in the 60s. But now that you've decided you want to run for president, you've decided again, let's kind of erase that lineage and heritage. Let's be white passing and run as a white woman. And we recognize that, hey, you're going to need an overabundance of support from white America in order to even have a shot at even possibly even being a GOP nominee if you can take down Orange Man and DeSantis. And so now you're willing to bypass all of that, bypass history and say everything that 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 demographic would like to hear if that means you have a shot at becoming president. Interesting. Now when we're talking about race, I've always said some people specifically only leave race in the conversation of feelings, but in order for a conversation of race to make sense, you have to talk about it from a standpoint of cause and effect origin and outcome. How do you get to that? The conversation of policy and legislation and implementation of that policy and legislation. And that's how you can always shut down a conversation of racism has never been a thing in America because you can look at policy and you can see everything that's happening right now in real time. So rather than trying to revamp and reinvent the wheel, 
The cool thing about this channel is we've had so many conversations on race that I always have examples ready on deck. So I'm going to play a clip that can quickly highlight a few examples of how policy and race go hand in hand and how that still affects us in modern times. But there's a quote in the book that specifically said the advantage that the FHA gave white families in the 1940s and the 1950s has become permanent. When I'm talking about the FHA, we're talking about redlining. Now, I've talked about redlining a lot on this channel, but I'm actually going to go a little bit deeper today, um, but I'm going to go with a different approach. So understand, long story short, redlining is what mapped out our country, 1940s, 1950s, even before then, really in the 1910s onwards. But in the 1940s and 1950s, we saw the emergence of like FHA loans. We saw the emergence of the GI Bill that gave people, you know, credits and stuff in regards to housing, really affordable housing. Of course, black people were left out of all of that. The FHA would not insure mortgages to black families. And so that created an opportunity where white families were able to accumulate a lot of wealth through property and equity. And so getting to my main point, right? So we have redlining, right? And with redlining, it just pretty much meant that you, you divided up specific cities and towns, right? You mapped out the cities and towns. And there was a color system, right? Green was what you wanted to live in. Green was specifically for white Americans. Green was, you know, that's, that's where all the best property is. The property by the water, the property by all the good schools and the stores and the resources and the shop. Everything is great. Then you had blue, right? Still pretty good, but it's kind of in a close proximity to some of those, those other neighborhoods that are too close to those other neighborhoods. So blue, there's blue. Then you get yellow. Yellow is kind of those neighborhoods where, ooh, the whiteness has been tainted. You might have a few Latinos in this mix. You might have a few Asians living in this area. You might even have a few people that are Irish in this area because this is right at the cusp of when white Americans decided to start identifying as white and not just as Polish or Irish or Italian or German or fin Finnish or, you know, Dutch. Now it's, we understand because again, the creation of unions has been going on for the last 30 years. They recognized there was more power in number in regards to unions and being able to get things done by seeing themselves as white. And we could have another conversation on what happened with some of these unions as far as how they literally use their power to fire black people as well and ensure that black people could not work in specific companies. I'll come to that on another day. But, you know, they recognized that that was what was happening. And so in regards to the color, you had green, blue, yellow, and then there was red. The minute one person who was black lived in a neighborhood, that neighborhood was automatically a red neighborhood. And so going with the issues that took place, black people were not allowed to live in any neighborhood other than the ones that were deemed red. There were lots of covenants and ordinances that were created all over the United States. The very first one was in Baltimore. And so it started and created a space where black people weren't allowed to live in certain regions. And so what ended up happening, right, as we talk about what happened over time is families were literally stuck in specific areas and it didn't matter how much money you made. It didn't matter what was going down. You could not get into some spaces. So even if you were a wealthy black American and you didn't need the FHA loans or the mortgages or anything because you had the money, didn't matter because there was a covenant that ensured that you still couldn't move to that neighborhood. So now we have these neighborhoods where you have black people in, in very densely populated areas and highly concentrated. And what was also very interesting is, you know, black people often were overcharged for their housing, right? And so a lot of times the housing was so expensive that black families had to find ways to ensure that they could take care of themselves. So now we get into the space where you have multiple families living in units together trying to pay the bills. Because again, black families were also taxed at higher rates than white families during this time period. And while we're at it, let me go ahead and, and highlight some of the nonsense that black folks had to deal with in regards to housing. And I know we're jumping everywhere, but stay with me because it's all gonna come together full circle in this conversation about the ideology that folks have in regards to where they think black people deserve to be in regards to their neighborhoods. But one of the things that was taking place when HUD was doing its audit back in the day, they pretty much discovered that black neighborhoods were way more overassessed in regards to property taxes. And so black neighborhoods and black families often paid way more in property taxes than white folks. You can take a city like Baltimore, where the tax burden in white neighborhoods was one ninth that of black families. Mind you, we already know which demographic in the country had the money because they already had equity and generational wealth from property and ownership from all of those moments where they're able to have a piece of something that black folks were not allowed to have, mainly because policy enforced it. You know, literally backed by the federal government where you have covenants and ordinances where folks can't live in certain neighborhoods. And so you have that taking place. Black folks often had to pay way more than what the property was worth in order to stay there, whether it be rent or a mortgage. And remember, a lot of the times there weren't mortgages, there were what you called contract sales, which I'm going to come back to in a second. And in addition to that, 
nationwide, black folks were charged 20% more for their housing situations at that point in time. When we talk about what was happening in 1954, because like I said, black folks were being so overcharged. And again, they weren't making the same kind of money that white Americans were making. This created a space where black families often had to shack up or overcrowd into properties to the point where overcrowding in black neighborhoods was four times that of white neighborhoods. And when we talked about the idea of doubling up, where you at least had two families living in one property, it was twice that for black families than white families. And so it created a space where black folks were often being overpriced and they had no other options because again, redlining limited where folks could live. And so because there were only so many places to choose from, folks had to pay these just outrageous prices to stay in, in, in one step from bottom tier kind of properties. Even when we talk about Manhattan, you know, black folks paid twice as much in regards to rent in Manhattan than white folks did. And all of this played into the conversation in the idea of property values. It was to the point where you had a landlord that had a storefront property that was 540 square feet and he divided that property into six units for families to live in. You literally had six families sharing 540 square feet. Absolutely crazy, but it gets even wilder because then within this country there's a thing called blockbusting And so a lot of white real estate agents recognized and knew that a lot of black families were desperate in regards to finding places to live Because there was just such a limitation in regards to housing Especially when it came to housing that was close enough to where people worked And so what they would do is they already knew that black folks were willing to pay way more for housing than white folks So what did they do? They would convince white folks that black folks were moving into their neighborhood because covenants and ordinances had been lifted and the property values of those neighborhoods were going to go down because the blacks were moving in. And so they would convince white folks to sell their property for way less than the value of the property and so they could get out the neighborhood faster because again, you know, white folks had to just, they, they were like, oh my God, these people are moving in. Like I just heard they moved in on the other block and somebody said they moved in down there. We got to get out of here because again, at this point, when you talk about the ideologies and the viewpoints of blacks, Blacks moving into the neighborhood means the property values are going down. When in reality, it was interesting because at that point in time, the properties of integrated neighborhoods actually appreciated way more than segregated. But let me stay on my main point. And so what they would also do to really make this even more crazy, because once the white folks sold off their property in Skip Town, then they would sell the property to black folks at a way higher rate than what the market price was. And black folks would pay for it because again, there's nowhere else to go. But it's even crazier because one, what they would do, they'd even hire black folks to play into this. They would hire black women to push strollers in the white neighborhoods just so the white people could see that, oh my God, Greg, look outside right now. Like, look outside your window. She's practically pushing a baby. Like, they're multiplying. And so, like, you know, it's freaking people out. So you had black women pushing babies in strollers and it was freaking the white folks out because it's like, oh my God, not only are they moving in, but they're making more of them. And then, in addition to that, they'd play, they pay black men to drive their cars in the neighborhood blasting the music which is kind of funny because this kind of comes back full circle with the story is in regards to that specific neighborhood in Sanford they didn't like the way he was driving that's apparently what triggered the whole thing but they would pay black men to drive through the neighborhood play their loud music and so that had folks freaking out like oh my god guys he's uh, uh, like he, he's playing that jazz it's uh, it's so loud oh my god he's playing the, the, the Billy Holiday like oh my god you know she hates America God, we got to get out of here. So they had that going. They even paid black people to call white households and ask for people with black names. They, hey, Darnell there. And now, Darnell? Darnell? You know, so folks were getting up out of there. And so white folks would get out. Black folks would move in, have to pay a much higher rate. And then the worst part, because black folks did not qualify for mortgages at that point in time in regards to the FHA and they were left out of the GI Bill, they paid into what you called contract sales, where... They go into these really crappy contracts where, yeah, you're going to get this house, but you're going to pay for everything in installments. And with that, you will not be eligible for any equity on this property for 15 to 20 years. So you will never make a dollar off of this for 15 to 20 years. This is just a place to leave, you know, to live. Something goes down and you move out, so be it. You leave empty handed. At least you had a place to stay. You will never make a dollar. It doesn't matter if you add a pool in the back, if you have the just top notch landscape and you add a bedroom, this property will be worth exactly what you paid for it when you got it for 15 to 20 years. And in addition to that if you miss one payment eviction comes in because they recognize that once you get out the next family's ready to move in and so it was just all over the place it's absolutely crazy and so when you kind of put everything into account what black families were dealing with at that point in time a lot of black families had to work multiple jobs in order to kind of pay this excessively high rent you know or, or these contract sales that they were living under and so it created a space where yeah you had this high rent 
multiple families living in the same spaces together, crammed in there. And so a lot of times folks somewhat would neglect their property because there was no time to do the landscaping. There was no time to go in and clean the gutters. There was no time to repaint because they were constantly working 12, 13, 14, sometimes 15 hour shifts back and forth to the point where you had a lot of kids that did not even get to finish school because they needed to take care and go get jobs and help the family because again, society had created a space where it was almost impossible for black folks to thrive even if they had money because of the limitations so now again it plays into that image because what happens to these black neighborhoods that also have no investment that also don't have all the nice grocery stores that don't have the best of the best schools because that whole idea of separate but equal was not really a thing because the black schools in the black neighborhoods were not receiving the same funding and we know how where all that goes and so that imaging of black people gets worse and worse and again it kind of cements that white fear and that white rage that already exists against black folks and it's like well look at their neighborhoods look how they treat look how they carry themselves i mean oh, i wouldn't want them in my neighborhood and so it gets even crazier because we're still not done so at this same time period while black folks are dealing with their nonsense you're starting to see the emergence of white suburbs right this is the 1940s going into the 1950s levittown is the perfect example i'm not going to spend all day on levittown because we've talked about it two or three times on this channel but just know that levittown was a white suburb built in long island county new york right and so this was going to be the ideal neighborhood the kind of place where white families would move to because this was the new wave of america the new element and the new aspect of patriotism moving into these new spaces and getting your own single family home with a nice yard. Levittown is pretty much the neighborhood that will create the idea of the white picket fence and that neighborhood with the nice little cute doggy that's walking and you know you bring the cherry or the apple pie to the neighbors that move in. Hey welcome wagon! You know so all of that pretty much comes out of the area of Levittown. Now again this is a whites only neighborhood. No if ands or buts. And you started to see a whole bunch of other Levittown type neighborhoods pop up. So that's what's happening on the white side of town. Now, coming back to where the Negroes were, so then I want to use an example like 1942 Detroit. So the people up top in regards to those who were developing the city decided, okay, we're going to create a space for black folks to live in. Because at the same time, there's still a lumber shortage because it's World War II and things have been, been repurposed in regards to, you know, where things are going to go. So a lot of times they had to cut back on what was being used for, you know, our luxuries and everything and they needed to go to the war. I did a video on, maybe it's my Steve Harvey video, but I talked about, you know, literally how even housing projects initially were for white families because they were pretty much on hold waiting to get the go ahead to build their single family home. So in the meantime, stay in these housing projects that were created until, you know, things open up. And back then housing projects were not the, the, the 80 foot, you know, 20 story high rises that we saw in places like Chicago or New York. You know, these were properties that had parks and, and playgrounds. So another conversation for another video. But anyway, so the, the developers in the area decided, okay, we need to create a space for a lot of black folks because there's nowhere else for them to live because they can't live amongst these white folks. And so they were going to create the Sojourn Truth Projects. And so some folks up top was like, this is a great idea, but we're not about to spend that kind of money on those people. So why don't we make this a whites only housing project? And so they did. And so you had a lot of white folks living in a neighborhood named after somebody black. And so you had the Sojourner Truth Project. So then you had the Detroit Housing Commission say, well, we still need to find a place for these people to live because we, we, we already allocated money specifically for black folks to have an area to live. And we got to put them somewhere. And so they find this plot of land in this industrial area. Because again, you know, they love to put black folks next to a factory and in a space where there's no green space, no trees, no grass, no clean water, nothing but metal, dust and glass. And so... They have this area allocated and they're going to start building this property and this is going to serve as housing projects for black families. Only problem is white folks were like, no, it's too close to our neighborhood. It's not far enough from us. So then that idea got shut down. So then the commission was like, well, we'll put them in Sojourner Truth because we ain't got nowhere else for them to go. So now they're moving black families into Sojourner Truth projects, which at this point is where white families are living. The white folks got pissed. Oh, they rioted. I mean, it, it got to a point. There's, there's a big giant race. It wasn't really a full-out massacre. They weren't killing nobody, but, you know, we've seen what happened in the past. But it's a full-out race riot. And, of course, all the black folks get arrested. So over 100 people get arrested. Only three of them were white. And you know what's crazier in all of this? One of the main people that was pushing the kickback and the protest for black folks moving into the Sojourner Truth apartments or Sojourner Truth projects... Freaking Eleanor Roosevelt, the same woman y'all love to gas up and try to paint. Oh, she was a, you know, she was a hero and she, she stepped in when her husband... 
Nah, she was just as trifling as the rest of them. She was one of the main ones leading the charge. Don't have them Negroes coming up in here. Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. I don't know who gave white women the PR of being the moral compass of the world and just being so loving and warm, but whoever their PR was, they did a good job up until about 2005 because they had all of us convinced that every white woman had a, just a warm heart, you know, and they were all heroes. Again, I'm not trying to speak for everybody, but like, again, like, kind of nonsense. Eleanor, mind your business, Eleanor, first of all. Nobody, you weren't even a part of this conversation. How are you going to jump in and try to lead a charge? <laughs> and they got all kind of statues named after her. Anyway. But it gets even crazier because, again, I got to drive my point to bring everything home. This will be my last example, and then I'm going to bring this back to the rapper. So stay with me. So in addition to this country being segregated by housing, it was segregated in every aspect in Rome, especially in education, because, again, folks didn't want their kids going to school with those kids. And so let's talk about that date that I gave you. Remember when I said June 26, 1959? Let's take a trip to Virginia, shall we? So we remember in 1954, you have Brown versus Board of Education. Schools are now supposed to be integrated. Segregation is now illegal. Now, a lot of the schools were not integrating. You wouldn't see a lot of schools integrate until after they started busing in the 70s. But I want to go to Prince Edward County, Virginia, right? And so it was pretty much determined that, yes, you guys have got to integrate your schools. Now, at this point, this is 1959. And so the people in charge as far as the school board, which, again, voted in by the residents of the county. And again, remember, black folks don't have voting rights at this point in time. So none of them were voting for anybody on the school board because, remember, our elections were not just about the president and the governor. This is electing your county sheriff, your county supervisor, you know, all of these different positions locally that play a huge role and will directly affect you a lot faster than what's happening from the federal level. And so the school board decided, well, we already told y'all these Negroes ain't going to school with our white children. Absolutely not. So, you know, what we'll do. We'll just close the schools. And so they literally closed the entire school district for five years. From 1959 to 1964, Prince Edward County Public Schools were closed. That way they didn't have to worry about having to integrate with black folks. But it gets even more intense because not only that, and I found this so interesting. So then they use state tuition grants and county tax credits to fund private schools that would pretty much serve the white kids so they could still go to school. So now... Not only did we close the public schools, we're going to use the public school money to fund, you know, these private institutions that will only be for white students and they'll be the only ones allowed to go to it. And this this went down for five years. And sadly, for black folks, a lot of black kids either had nowhere to go to school or they had to travel out of state to go to school or they did makeshift schools where, you know, somebody opened up a classroom in a church basement and they tried to do the best that they could. And so. In 1964, finally, you know, the courts came in and was like, y'all can't do that. And on top of that, y'all using public money to do private, no, that, that, you can't do that. It, no, no, no. And so it just gets crazier and crazier. And so that's kind of leading into the conversation that we've had. This country has been so segregated and not just by feelings, but by policy. And the policy pretty much enforces and, and almost endorses those feelings. So it goes back and forth full circle. And so even when you're talking about transit, you can even talk about Baltimore again, where in 1975, there was plans to have a transit system going from Anne Arundel County, Maryland to Baltimore. What happened? The residents said, uh-uh, we don't want them Baltimore kids coming up on this side of town and them folks coming over here and robbing our stores and, and raping our women and stealing everything and burning all everything down and burning down, you know, bringing down the property values because them property values, they're just so, so valuable. And so they voted against the transit system, which is so funny because half the people in that county need to get to Baltimore to go to work. So they were said, you know, we'll, we'll just cut off our own nose and just find our own ways to work rather than using, you know, a brand new subway system to get there because we don't want those other people having access to leave Baltimore and come into our county. As if people that live in the city want to spend their time in the suburbs. Ain't nothing in the suburbs but franchises. All of the cultural establishments that people like to go to as far as the clubs and all the different things that people like, the museum, all of that is in the city. You go to the suburbs to go to sleep and, and to eat and raise your family, but everything is in the city. That's why everybody's moving back to the cities now. And that's why everybody's renting so freaking high. And so it's even crazier because then when we get to 2015, same city, we're talking about Baltimore. You know, there were plans to use a whole bunch of money to, again, enhance some transit that would allow more mobile access in throughout the city. They said, no, we're going to actually use that money to enhance our freeways instead, which, again, even that project kind of fell apart. So it's just like... You see so much chaos, and, and I've talked about this before, even like when you talk about neighborhoods in the suburbs where they get rid of the basketball hoop because there's too many black kids playing on it. Now, 
That was just a handful of examples. Now imagine if I sat here and I laid out every single piece of legislative policy from every state, district, county, city, town that was inspired and implemented through the element of racism. We would be here all day, okay? This would be an all day live, kind of like a telethon. I'd have to put a 1-800 number right here just to keep everything going because just imagine we would be here all day. And the crazy part about all that is, like I said, I just scratched the surface. I didn't go and list every single covenant and ordinance that was created in regard to making sure that black people couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. I just used a few examples, right? I didn't name and list every single school district in the country that had these very draconian approaches to what happened when they were trying to integrate the schools, right? That was just a handful of examples. And, and look at the example. They shut the whole school district down. They just said, we ain't gonna have no school because we are not sending our kids with those kids. Imagine that, right? Those are just small examples, but the thing is, those are just examples of the past. But a lot of the examples, especially when we're talking about the housing, that conversation of cause and effect, when you're talking about wealth, how do people tend to build their wealth? Land ownership, property, which demographic of people was left out of that conversation and got the bare minimum and got scraps and had to make do with what it was they could. Black America. This is what I'm talking about when we talk about racism. So when people break their necks to talk about, oh, racism is a thing of the past or it's not even a thing of the past anymore. It's never been a thing. Don't play in my face. Like that's some nonsense and you know it. And the crazy thing is Nikki is so pressed to get an element of power that she will erase her own identity to try and be a part of a community that doesn't even want her. Imagine that. And the only way that they will take her is if she compromises everything about herself. Change her name. You know, well, not even change her name. Nikki's her middle name. Nimarada's the first name. Go by her middle name, right? Use the middle name. You don't ever hear a whole lot about her culture. And everything that she does, she's going to do everything that she can do to make sure that she doesn't offend that demographic, that she keeps them comfortable. To me, that's somebody with no spine. That's somebody that will blow wherever the wind blows if it means that they can be in power. And that means that's somebody that I have no leverage with as a voter. Because I know that I will be collateral because she's going to be so far up there behind that she could say to hell with everybody else. And that's exactly what she's doing. And so now in this modern space, I was just naming examples from the past. But even when we talk about what's happening now, all of the seam ripping, we're in this era. And I just said this on the last slide. We're in an era where you're watching 30, 40, 50, 60 years of progress be gutted and seam ripped in a matter of weeks, months, with the stroke of a pen. Right? Not because anybody has been harmed but because there are people who still want to maintain and uphold, uphold a status quo. There are people who still want to remain in a specific space of power, which means that everybody else must be collateral, and so they're going to do everything in their power. So we've watched what's happened with affirmative action. We've watched what's happened with the Voting Rights Act. Understand, Section 2A of the Voting Rights Act is now on the docket, and I guarantee you give it some more time, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act will also be on the docket soon enough. You've seen this whole anti-CRT movement. You've seen the whole anti-woke movement. Definition, just understand, when they're saying woke, what they're saying is they want everybody who wants to talk about all the atrocities in America to shut up, specifically black folks. Woke for them is code for black at this point. They use it every single time. Wokey, woke, woke, woke. DeSantis is literally the person who might be second in charge with the GOP if he gets a chance and, and somehow maybe pushes old boy out the way, he's run a whole campaign on no policy. His whole policy is just anti-woke, where woke goes to die, right? And so you were watching books be banned and librarians possibly be arrested and charged, all kind of crazy things, all because racism is that strong in this country. So for Nikki to sit there and act like she's blind to it all, don't play in my face. Do not play in my face. Especially when you don't even know who you are anymore because you're so pressed trying to get, get into a political position of power that you said to hell with your own identity, to hell with your own people. Imagine that. <laughs> anyway, I'm out. Share your two cents. Subscribe.